Hello, I am Dr. Keith Burke, a professor of behavioral sciences in the Alcohol and Other Drug Studies program at San Diego City College. The AODS program is a fully accredited college level coursework program that is designed to train students in the required coursework needed to become a certified alcohol and drug counselor in the state of California. Today, I'm going to talk about family counseling in substance use treatment. In the past, family counseling in substance use treatment was much less common than it is today. The number of treatment providers, including family counseling and substance use treatment, has continued to climb through the years because there is now a lot of research data showing it's incredibly effective. Uh, essentially, the people who receive substance use treatment and whose families are involved uh, tend to complete the program, stay sober longer, uh, don't return as much. Um, a recent study in 2016 by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or SAMHSA, uh, which is the U.S. agency responsible for overseeing federal policy regarding substance use treatment, uh, SAMHSA found that 85% of substance use treatment programs are offering some kind of at least marital or couples counseling, so the spouse or partner of the person who's in substance use treatment has been involved in the treatment, uh, and 65% of substance use treatment facilities are doing some form of family counseling, uh, either involving the spouse or involving other family members. When families are included in substance use treatment, the rates of completion are much higher, meaning that people tend to actually complete the program uh, versus leaving early against medical advice. There are also much lower rates of recidivism, meaning people who are coming back into treatment and much lower uh, rates of relapse. So because of this uh, outcomes data or evidence, the expert panels recommend that all substance use treatment agencies and their providers incorporate family counseling into their treatment programs. In San Diego, there are some treatment facilities that may employ licensed marriage family therapists or LMFTs to counsel the families. However, it is within the scope of practice for certified alcohol and drug counselors to provide family counseling when one or more of the family members is being treated for a substance use disorder meaning that while LMFTs are master's level trained clinicians in trained in working in marriages and family therapy settings, drug and alcohol counselors are trained and certified to do family counseling when it's done at a substance use treatment facility and one or more of the people in the family have a substance use disorder. Now in substance use facilities, Typically, certified alcohol and drug counselors are better prepared to address factors in the family system that may be contributing to the substance use disorder. Uh, alcohol and drug counselors are also typically better prepared to address how the substance use disorder is affecting the family system. And perhaps most significantly, alcohol and drug counselors are very well prepared to work with the family system to enlist support and to implement a family supported relapse prevention plan. Family relapse prevention planning is a very significant and crucial intervention that's done with people who are in substance use treatment to prepare them to uh, re-enter the family system and is subject of a different lecture and a different recording uh, that I will be covering at a later date. Uh, it's worth noting that alcohol and drug counselors in California receive up to 645 hours of training in the treatment of substance use disorders, compared to 48 hours or less in most MFT training programs. So 645 hours, alcohol and drug counselors, about 48 hours or less, licensed marriage family therapists. 
Uh, now, I am a licensed clinician, and I'm a big supporter of licensed clinicians, but the truth is licensed mental health clinicians don't get near the amount of training in substance use disorders, both how substance use disorders develop, how best to treat substance use disorders, and how best to prevent relapse. So the alcohol and drug counselor is very well suited to talk with families in a substance use treatment facility when the primary focus is how the substance use disorder is affecting the family and the family is affecting the substance use disorder. SAMHSA, again, the federal agency responsible for policy in the United States regarding treatment for substance use disorders, recommend that all trainee alcohol and drug counselors who are working towards certification or licensing in their state be trained in the principles and practice of family counseling and substance use treatment facilities and be prepared to counsel families. And California supports that SAMHSA recommendation. I have unfortunately heard over the years, uh, people who went through the training program at the Alcohol and Other Drug Studies Program at San Diego City College, who have told me that they were working in facilities and have been told by licensed mental health clinicians that they're not allowed to counsel families, that somehow that's outside of the scope of alcohol and drug counselors. That is patently false. Again, both SAMHSA and the state of California not only require that alcohol and drug counselors be trained in family counseling, uh, but they recommend the family counseling is included in all substance use treatment facilities. And in many cases, the alcohol and drug counselor is the one that's most suited to do that family counseling. Now, note that unless an alcohol and drug counselor is also a licensed mental health clinician, a licensed psychologist, mar marriage family therapist, or another clinician, uh, an alcohol and drug counselor cannot practice traditional family therapy outside of a substance use treatment facility. That is considered outside of an alcohol and drug counselor's scope of practice. However, an alcohol and drug counselor can absolutely incorporate family therapy skill sets and family therapy techniques into their counseling work with individuals and their families. And of course, an alcohol and drug counselor can always refer families to licensed marriage family therapists to address other issues that may be there in the family system. All right, why is family counseling so important in drug treatment? For an alcohol and drug counselor, everything we do when working with clients boils down to answering these two questions why does my client use substances? So in spite of negative consequences and the use of substances causing enough problems that it landed this person into substance use treatment, why were they using those substances and why did they continue to use? And the second question is, what's going to stop my client from using substances in a problematic way when he or she leaves treatment? So everything else that a substance use counselor or an alcohol and drug counselor does uh, boils down to essentially answering one of those two questions. Why is my client use substances? What's gonna stop them from using substances when they leave treatment? Now, what will stop you from using substances when you leave treatment is, is the primary focus of what treatment is. And it's called relapse prevention, which we discuss later in the semester in the family counseling class. And it's also discussed at length in numerous classes throughout the AODS program. However, to try and determine what will prevent relapse, first, you usually need to address the causes of the substance use, understand why the person's using substances before you can address risk factors to prevent a return to using substances. So you can look at it simplistically as why do you use substances addresses all the factors that took place prior to the person coming into treatment. What's going to stop you from using substances when you leave here will address factors for when the person leaves treatment. There are many causes for addiction or e the etiology of addiction. Uh, for those of you who are watching this video who are studying towards taking the state certification exam in the state of California or a licensing exam perhaps in another state, uh, note that etiology, etiology means cause. And there's often a test on the certification exam that'll ask about the 
etiology of addiction or substance use disorders. So there are many things that contribute to the development of addiction or a substance use disorder, but there's a very important dimension of social and family relationship factors. Families are a major factor when considering both why somebody uses substances and what's going to prevent them from using when they leave treatment. Family attitudes and communications about substance use have a very strong influence on both why the person's using substances and what's going to stop them from using. And those attitudes and communications can go both ways. It could influence somebody to continue using or why they were using in the first place, or it help, could help to influence somebody from not using any longer. So how does that work? When people pick up substances, that's a phrase that's often used out there in the field. It's kind of a colloquialism. So pick up, like picking up. When people pick up substances, it's often because it's encouraged either explicitly or implicitly, particularly at first. When somebody first starts using substances, usually somebody said, hey, you want to get high or some variation on that or hey, look what I got. You want to try this. And families can have a very strong influence, again, in both directions in terms of why somebody picks up substances. Uh, how the family models substance use. So if the family is using uh, drugs, if mom and dad are both using heroin, well, they're modeling heroin use in the family system. And if the teenage children are aware of this happening, that could influence them picking up heroin. Uh, the normalization of alcohol and drug use. If alcohol is a, a key part of almost all family functions, uh, and the person sees that, that could impact why somebody may pick up substances. Now, in the reverse, how parents model substance use. If the parents uh, drink but never drink more than two drinks or never get behind the wheel of a car you know, when drinking alcohol, then they're modeling responsible alcohol use. Uh, peer pressure and sibling pressure have a big role in both why people may pick up substances and or why they may avoid uh, using substances. And many a person who ends up in substance use treatment talks about how they used with their siblings and in some cases with their parents as a factor as to why the substance use developed and got out of control. Uh, availability influences why somebody picks up substances. There are many, many teenagers and sometimes younger than teenage children who had their first drink because they wandered around the morning after a huge blowout party and there's a bunch of half emptied glasses of alcohol laying around the house and they're experimenting by trying that. Uh, there are gender cultural norms that can influence why people pick up or if they use certain types of substances and outright coercion can be a factor too. Coercion meaning sometimes people are forced to use substances, even if they're not sure about whether they really wanna do this or they're ambivalent about it. Uh, I have heard many a story in my clinical practice about uh, drugs and alcohol being used as leverage in some way, where a family member essentially forced another family member to use substances, either to enable their own substance use, or in some cases, there might have been drug dealing going on in the family and involving other family members in the use or production of drugs um, not only ensures that um, to be able to continue, uh, but sometimes lends assistance to the process. We also know that many people use substances as a coping skill. Um, dysfunctional families are often a major source of stress and emotional dysregulation. What I mean by that is that if there is, for example, domestic violence in a family system, that is gonna really stress people out both the people who are actively involved in the domestic violence, uh, meaning they may be the perpetrator or they may be the victim or survivor of the domestic violence, but everybody else that's around that domestic violence is gonna be impacted by that. And we know from research that many people continue to use substances after they first picked up to deal with stress as a form of emotional regulation. Uh, substances directly affect the nervous system. We have a class in the Alcohol and Other Drug Studies program here at San Diego City College on the pharmacology 
or how drugs and alcohol impact uh, the brain and the body. And we know that drugs affect the nervous system. Uh, you use drugs and it's going to affect how you feel. Uh, if somebody is, uh, if somebody does a line of cocaine, I mean, that is definitely going to wake up their nervous system. Like, whoo! Okay. And so it's directly impacting the nervous system. The person wasn't feeling that way until they used the drugs. Uh, certainly if somebody's using psychedelics, that's going to impact the nervous system, the brain and the nervous system, where suddenly they may be uh, seeing things or hearing things or having sensory enhancements that are directly impacted from the substance. Uh, we also know substances influence our perception of emotions. So uh, feelings of being relaxed or feelings of excitement are very strongly influenced by any substance that we may put into our system. Um, sorry, let me go back to that slide. So many times what happens is family systems may be a source of stress or emotional dysregulation and people pick up substances or continue to use the substances because it's helping them navigate and modulate their own nervous system. Uh, feeling anxiety, drink alcohol, tend to not feel so anxious. And so it gets built into the system. My family really is stressing me out because of the things that are happening here. I get used to drinking alcohol because it helps me with my anxiety at least at first. In addition to families influencing why and how a person uses substances, uh, the alcohol and drug use itself, outside of all other stressors, causes a lot of stress in the family system. And a recent study in 2008 or uh, 2018 found that 30% of all Americans report that there is drug use in the home that's causing problems and 37% of all Americans report that there's alcohol use in the family system that's causing problems. So one of the foundational principles in the treatment of substance use disorder is, rec is recognizing that the family has a central role to play in the treatment of any health problem, including substance use. You cannot separate the substance abuser from the family system that they belong to which includes families of origin, meaning your childhood, and it includes current family relationships. So the essential idea is that the substance user influences the family system, even if they're living apart. So, you know, if I'm a father and my 26 year old daughter has a heroin use disorder and it's causing her to uh, be homeless and jobless and I'm super worried about what's going on with her, then her substance use is influencing the family system, even though she may not be living in the family system. But we recognize in substance use treatment that while the using of substances influences the family, the family also influences the substance use because of all the things we just talked about, what, how and when somebody first picked up substances, family and emotional stressors in the system that may contribute to why the person continues to use substances, uh, and even family reactions to the substance use can influence how the substance using member approaches the substance use, the recovery from substances, uh, or preventing relapse. So then the goal of family counseling in a substance use treatment facility is to address both how the using is affecting the family system and how the family system is affecting the using. We treat both. Now, an important idea in treating families is to understand the concept of homeostasis. So homeostasis is a, a principle that says that the family is a system and that each part in that system relates to all the other parts in that system. And any change in the family system is going to impact or change all of the other parts in the system, meaning that everybody in the family system is going to be impacted by the substance use and stress from the substance use, even if they're choosing to ignore it. Homeostasis is a principle that came out of science, and you can really see it in ecology systems. The idea is that in any given ecology, uh, there, there's a system, and any change in that system is going to affect all the rest of the system. Uh, in California, we typically have lots of issues with fires. Um, 
uh, forest fires and other things like that. And a fire uh, will affect the system. So if a fire goes through and it burns out all the vegetation in an area, well, that vegetation and now the lack of vegetation is going to impact the animals that both live in that vegetation and in some cases feed off that vegetation. And those animals may end up leaving the system because of that, which then may cause other things to grow that may have been typically eaten by the rabbits. Now it's not controlled by that and the weeds grow out of control. And what's happening is the fire impacted the system, but the fire impacting the system also impacted the animals in that system and it impacted the vegetation that's in that system. So the idea of homeostasis is that when a system is impacted, everything in that system is going to be affected by it. And in a family, substance use and the stress associated with substance use is going to impact the family system, even if they're choosing to ignore it, or in some cases, choosing to enable it. So with homeostasis, it's recognition that all systems, including families, deal with stress and pressure by making adjustments to maintain stability, balance, and constancy as much as possible. So, uh, if the forest burns down, then the system will make an adjustment. If forest burns down, all the vegetation is burned, the animals are leaving, then what will happen is the system will start to make adjustments by regrowing the vegetation. And forests are pretty amazing uh, for their ability to regenerate after a forest fire. The vegetation comes back really quickly. But then maybe the weeds are starting to grow out of control because there's no animals there. And so the system will attract rabbits back into the system once it starts to regrow the vegetation. And now the rabbits are starting to eat the vegetation, but then the rabbits are starting to get out of control. And so it brings in you know, other predators and coyotes that are feeding on the rabbits to try and keep the system uh, balanced as much as possible. That doesn't mean that it isn't stressful, but there's a tendency in any system under stress to develop complex and predictable behaviors to try and maintain equilibrium or to limit the chaos and conflict, which still may feel stressful, traumatic, or unsatisfactory. So in family systems where there's substance use disorders, there are typically all kinds of behaviors that are developed to try and maintain stability as much as possible. Now, some of those things may be healthy uh, in that a healthy response may be to address the substance use directly, to you know, say to my wife, hey, like, honey, I'm really concerned about the amount of drinking that you're doing and it's getting in the way of you getting, you know, to work on time and I'm really worried about you losing your job and, you know, we need to do something to take care of this. But I may also try to maintain stability by ignoring my wife's alcohol use and instead, uh, you know, trying to pretend it's not happening or enabling it in some ways. Uh, I drive her around so that she's not getting behind the wheel of a car, but it's not actually addressing the substance use directly. So the essential idea when treating families is that homeostasis is almost always going to be in play. And this family will be making adjustments in their behaviors and their thoughts and how they direct things in order to maintain as much stability as possible. Now, the family member with the substance use disorder is usually the main stressor in the family system, but not always. Sometimes the main stressor in the family system may be something else, and the substance use is a symptom of that. I remember I, I was working with a family once where the teenage son uh, was referred to treatment because of his marijuana use. So he was getting in trouble in, in school. Uh, and he was getting kicked out because of his marijuana use. And it turned out that the marijuana use was directly related to the fact that he was growing up in a domestic violence situation with a mother who had a heroin use disorder problem uh, and a very abusive stepfather figure um, that my client was using marijuana to attempt to deal with the stress. Typically in a family system, as the substance use gets worse then the adjustments and the behaviors that are made by the family in order to try and maintain stability uh, tend to get more firmly entrenched. And many times what happens in dysfunctional family systems is the family tries to deal with the problem often by not dealing with the problem or pretending that it doesn't exist. In this case, 
then what will happen is the family with a substance user in the family system, by adapting and accommodating to maintain homeostasis, many times they're doing it without addressing other core issues that are happening in the family. So uh, oftentimes there's fear that to address the issues directly might cause even more stress in the family system. So instead, what's happening is we have a dysfunctional system that's under stress where everybody's making these adjustments to try and maintain stability, uh, but it is neither healthy nor pleasing to anybody in that family system. And so that's where family counseling then comes in. There are typically two types of family counseling that's done in substance use treatment facilities. Uh, the first one is called family involved counseling where the family becomes involved in the substance users treatment but the family system isn't necessarily being treated itself uh, this often looks like family days maybe there's a saturday once a month in an inpatient or residential treatment facility where the family members are invited in and there's a lecture about how drugs affect the brain and maybe there's an Al-Anon meeting on site and the family gets to meet with uh, their family member and his or her counselor and kind of talk about the progress that's happening in treatment. So family involved counseling is getting the family involved and SAMHSA uh, recognizes that that is a type of family counseling that is helpful in that uh, when family's not involved at all, then you tend to have much worse outcomes. And so getting the family involved in any way can be helpful. The problem with family involved counseling is it typically neglects to address the family system as a whole. Instead, what's happening is all the focus is on the substance user, not factors that might be contributing to the substance use. Whereas family counseling that's done in substance use treatment, the family system as a whole becomes the focus of the treatment, meaning that uh, the, my client, you know, may be a 16 year old son in a family system and in a family involved setting, the uh, mom and the stepdad and the brother may come to family day and we kind of talk about, you know, the progress that um, uh, we'll call him uh, Juan. We'll talk about the progress Juan is making in his treatment. But in a family involved counseling setting, we're probably not addressing mom's heroin use or the domestic violence or the stress that's happening in the, in the home. Whereas in family counseling, we would address everything that's happening in the family system. So not just Juan and his treatment, my client Juan and his treatment, but actually talk about what's happening in the, in the home and how that might be impacting um, everything that's happening. The, the term family counseling uh, is really pretty broad. When we talk about who can participate in family counseling, certainly nuclear families, you know, meaning mom and dad and 2.3 kids, right, can contribute in family counseling. Uh, but family counseling may be involving single parents or foster relationships or step families or extended families. Um, or even elected families. So people who are joined by choice versus joined by blood or by marriage or by law. Uh, I worked at one point with homeless teenagers and in many cases, homeless teenagers create these elected families while they're living out there in the street. Uh, sometimes they'll even be a designated like mom or dad in the group, uh, even though they're all a bunch of teenagers and they're not related to each other by blood or by marriage. Uh, it's totally appropriate to have the elective family members in something like that uh, get involved in the family counseling. Essentially, it's whoever the individual in treatment's closest emotional relationships are. And so if there's anyone that there's an enduring emotional involvement or anyone who regularly impacts the family or really anybody that the, the people think of as family, it's appropriate for them to participate. So if the next door neighbor always has hung out, you know, at the house for the last 15 years, and, you know, she grew up with, you know, my 16 year old client Juan, and the family says, hey, uh, I think it'd be really important to include um, uh, Mary in Juan's, you know, uh, family counseling session, if the family wants them there, if they feel like Mary is part of the family, then we can include them in family counseling. Typically, we don't start family counseling until the person in treatment has made progress and is ready to address family system issues. 
Uh, in early treatment, many times clients need to address just some basic issues needed to remain sober. So if a person comes into treatment, they've only been there for three days, we may not wanna bring the family yet because we may not even understand why this person's using substances. The client themselves may not understand why they're using substances. Or maybe we haven't really addressed issues of triggers and craving and or adhering to medications, et cetera. So uh, oftentimes in that early stage of treatment, which is often referred to as stabilization, it's not appropriate to bring the family in. Uh, and in some cases, bringing the family in too early can potentially overwhelm somebody who's in early recovery, and that could contribute to relapse behaviors. So we usually bring the family in after some progress has been made. At minimum, Involving the family in the creation of a relapse prevention plan is highly recommended, and this is considered a clinical best practice. So if the treatment is a short stay, for example, many inpatient residential treatment programs are very short, 28 days or less in some cases. So if somebody is in your treatment program for less than a month, you're probably not gonna be able to have six or seven family counseling sessions. You may be lucky if you're only able to have one family counseling session. So if you're only gonna have one family counseling session, uh, at minimum, involving the family in the relapse prevention planning is considered the best use of that time. Uh, there's lots of things that relate to family relapse prevention planning. Uh, identifying the household that the person's going to go back into. Is this a safe space? Are there drugs and alcohol in that system? Are there any emotional or behavioral triggers in the family system that could encourage substance use relapse? Uh, we talk with the individual and the family about how to develop strategies for addressing relapse risks and managing craving states. Uh, there's much, much better treatment outcomes uh, with family relapse prevention planning. It's so important, in fact, I have an entire lecture just on family relapse prevention planning itself, uh, and I will have a separate recording, a recorded lecture that addresses family relapse prevention planning. All right, general family counseling goals. Um, so th these are in no particular order, these are the general things that are goals when we're doing family counseling. So. Uh, we want to reframe the treatment discussion to address the family system as a whole versus the addict alone. Uh, many times when I've done family counseling, the family comes in in that first session, it's like, oh, okay, we're here. Uh, we're ready to focus on Juan and Juan's problems. And so what a big part of usually initial family counseling is, is me helping the family system understand, um, yeah, great, thanks for coming. We're definitely gonna talk about Juan and what's going on with Juan and Juan's treatment. Uh, but there's some things about the family system as a whole that we should address. And so refocusing that discussion to address the family system is a general goal. Typically, families that come into a family counseling session often don't have a lot of resources uh, regarding education and support about substance use treatment. Every single program that I'm aware of in San Diego County, and I'm sure it's across the country, includes psychoeducation as part of treatment for the person with a substance use disorder, meaning that they get education about the nature of substance use disorders or addiction and what causes them and what's best treatment recommendations. And many times the person who's using substances doesn't have that education. Well, if the person who's using substances doesn't have that education, you can assume the family usually definitely doesn't have that education either. And many times the family doesn't have support. They don't have anybody that they can talk to about what's been happening. Uh, in the house and in the home and in relation to the substance use disorder. Um, people typically don't talk about it. Uh, if my wife's alcohol use is starting to really get out of control and I run into a neighbor at the grocery store and they're like, oh, hey, how's the family? Uh, most of the time people don't say, well, you know, my wife's alcohol use is getting really bad. In fact, I'm, I'm thinking she's an alcoholic and uh, man, it's creating chaos at the home and I keep having to call in her job and 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 call in sick for her so that she doesn't lose her job, right? People don't talk about that. So instead what happens is they're not talking about it at all, which typically then means they're not getting any support from anybody outside of treatment. And so we can use family counseling to talk about programs related to both education and support. Uh, Al-Anon is a great program uh, that was first designed for the families of people with alcohol use disorders and it's since expanded uh, and addresses all kinds of substance use disorders for the family. 
Uh, family counseling goals, teaching the family members about substance abuse, addressing substance related issues, identifying how to support the person who's in treatment. As I said earlier, working together to identify a relapse prevention plan. Uh, that's a core of the work that we do. Uh, and strengthening the entire family's behavioral and emotional health so that we limit the stressors in the family system that may be contributing to the substance use uh, and help everybody in the family system to thrive. We also want to provide a safe and neutral space to help family members make changes. Uh, many times what will happen is the family counseling session is a place that the family can address an issue and come up with some ideas about how to change this problem or support this problem. And so we can use family counseling in the actual session to practice better communication skills, to learn how to treat each other with acceptance and respect. Uh, we can address enabling unhealthy behaviors and learning how to trust and support one another uh, and apply the lessons that the family's learning from treatment in the home setting. And then again, towards the end of treatment, um, typically in a relapse prevention planning type of session, uh, we can talk about transitioning into sober support outside of treatment when the person goes back home. Uh, we want the family in a family counseling session to develop awareness. I remember uh, when I was uh, being trained, a supervisor had said to me that uh, counseling always boils down to basically one of two things, developing awareness and taking action. And he said everything is always either that one of those two things, either you're helping the person in the family develop awareness of what's going on, because if they're not really aware of it, then they're not going to be able to do anything about it. But once they become aware of it, then what we're doing is we're helping them take action. What are we going to do about this thing that we've learned about? So developing awareness um, for the family is an important goal of family counseling, helping them learn to look at how they act and interact with each other and identify, are, are they interacting with each other in ways that are harmful or helpful? Uh, what types of changes are needed to happen to support both the person who's in treatment and the family system? And what specific ways can we practice new skills? All right, there are three foundational skills that are typically found in healthy family systems uh, as uh, based on research of family systems as a whole. And those three things are usually the three skill sets that we address in family counseling settings. Uh, so researchers have found there are three skills that are key to all healthy family systems. The first one is clear communication. So the, uh, in a healthy family system, the family is able to clearly communicate, talk about, and address things that are going on in the family system. The second key skill in a healthy family system is acceptance of what's happening in the family system. Now, acceptance doesn't necessarily mean agreement, but it's an acceptance of, okay, this is what's going on, or we don't see this the same way, but I accept the fact that you have this viewpoint, which is different from my viewpoint, but I think we should talk about how we're gonna resolve this. Uh, whereas in unhealthy family systems, there's usually a lack of acceptance. There, there's resistance to accepting that or no, you're wrong. You know, you need to see it the same way that I'm seeing it. And then the third key skill that healthy family systems have is problem solving, collective problem solving, where the entire family is working together. Now, note that these are actually ordered by number meaning that you have to have clear communication first, because if you don't have clear communication, then you're not even addressing what the issues are. But you may have clear communication, meaning that the family system is talking about what the problem is, but we don't have acceptance. They're spending a lot of time arguing with each other and trying to convince each other, or maybe using power and authority. I don't care what you think. I'm the dad in the system, and this is the way it's gonna be. So we may have clear communication, but we don't have acceptance. So we have to have clear communication and acceptance before we can do problem solving. It's actually a mistake that many new clinicians make when they're first working with families is they try to leap into solving the problems without establishing clear communication and acceptance. And if you're trying to solve a problem when you're not actually clearly talking about what the problem is or there's no acceptance of differences of opinions, you aren't gonna get anywhere very fast. So most families that we treat uh, in a substance use treatment facility are missing all or part of these tools. 
So either they don't have clear communication acceptance or collective problem solving, or maybe they, they have clear communication, they're talking about what the issue is, uh, but they just don't have acceptance or, the, or problem solving. And so this is where all the work and the healing happens. Let's talk a little bit more about each of those. So clear communication. Uh, clear communication means that within the family, they're able to identify the specific problem. So when families don't have clear communication, typically they have things like poor listening skills. They don't listen to each other, hear each other, a tendency to interrupt each other or move quickly to criticism. So somebody starts to talk about something and somebody quickly jumps in and says, yeah, well, that was your fault. I told you you shouldn't have done that. Uh, it may not feel safe to share emotions. You get attacked when you uh, express how you feel about something or avoidance or aggression is being used as a defense. If somebody uh, tries to bring something up and somebody else is like, whatever, I am so not talking about this again, right? That would be avoidance, you know, or somebody brings something up and they're attacked because of that, that would be aggression. Uh, or the family system may have, lack the ability to express their thoughts clearly about something. Uh, many times that's a key part of counseling and therapy is just helping people express and understand what it is that they're really upset about. Now, when we're helping with clear communication, there's two parts to that. The first one is we need to help family members talk. There's two parts to communication. Communication entails talking and communication entails listening. So a lot of times we may have to help family members learn how to talk in the family system. Uh, that may entail providing platforms to individual members to identify problems or concerns. Uh, maybe, uh, I'll just keep using my, my family with, you know, 16 year old Juan in the family system and maybe his 15 year old sister is there and she hasn't said anything. The family's come and mom is there and stepdad's there and 15 year old sister's there and we haven't heard anything from the 15 year old sister. Uh, I may have to make a platform for her and to reach out, uh, you know, and, you know, say to her, uh, Maria, we haven't actually heard anything from you, and I'm wondering how you've been impacted by what sounds like a lot of stress in the family system. So that would be providing a platform to get her to talk. Uh, gatekeeping strategies. So gatekeeping strategies is essentially like directing traffic. So the counselor is making space for uh, some people to speak stopping somebody else from speaking. I like to think of it like a traffic cop when the uh, traffic police person, when a stoplight goes out. And so they get out and they're like, okay, like, whoa, everybody wait, hold on, right? Stops all the traffic and then says, okay, you over there, like, let's go, this group, start coming, start coming. Okay, hold on, you people on the side, hold on, not yet, not yet, keep coming, keep coming, keep coming, okay, stop. Now you on the side, let's go, let's go, let's go. So gatekeeping is a way of directing traffic, if you will, in the family counseling setting so that we can help people um, have space to speak and in some cases uh, stop somebody for who may be dominating the discussion. Uh, we use clarifications or reflective listening to help members express themselves more clearly. Uh, we go over reflective listening a lot in the EODS program where the counselor is essentially saying, I think what I hear you saying is, and they repeat back or reflect back what the person said to make sure that the person feels heard and everybody else understands. Um, and asking about feelings and encouraging emotional expressions is a big part of helping family members talk. We also help family members listen to each other. So we may set a practice of no interruptions in the family counseling setting and may encourage the family to practice that same rule when they're back at home. Uh, introducing the family to reflective listening. So the counselor can use reflective listening, but it can be really helpful for the family members to learn how to do that with each other. Like, okay, okay, I hear you. I think what you're trying to say is, right? No, 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 that's not what I'm saying at all. Like, okay, well then what are you saying? I don't understand. Okay, well, let me repeat myself. That um, skill set of using reflective listening and then when not feeling like that's the correct message, re-delivering the message is an important skill related to listening. Uh, we can model reflective listening and facilitate discussion. Uh, teaching members how to give their full attention to each other uh, and practicing al alternate means of communication. Uh, one very common technique that's used in family counseling is to have family members write a letter 
where they write the letter by themselves, where they're not feeling flustered or overwhelmed by the other family members being there. They can get their thoughts down on paper, and then everybody brings their letters back to the family counseling session, and, and each person gets to read their letter without interruption. Uh, that's encouraging everyone to listen to what the person has to say. Certainly more to facilitating clear communication, uh, but that's a, a good introduction to that. So acceptance was the second key skill. So acceptance in a family system often you know, entails teaching family members that accepting someone else's viewpoint doesn't necessarily mean that you have to agree with that viewpoint. Um, you know, maybe in my family system, you know, my 16 year old client Juan is saying, uh, you know, mom, it's ridiculous. Like, you know, I have to be home at nine o'clock and none of my friends have a curfew. And the mom says, well, that's crazy, Juan. You're 16 years old and you've been, you know, smoking marijuana, getting kicked out of school. Of course, I'm going to have a curfew. And so we may then, as the counselor, jump in and say, okay, so uh, Juan, I think what I'm hearing you say is that having a curfew feels really restrictive and none of your friends have curfews, which feels unfair. Am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So mom, I think what I'm hearing you say is that not having a curfew could be dangerous in this setting because Juan previously has been using drugs and you feel like having a curfew is really important to keep him safe uh, and to know what's going on with him. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So mom, you don't need to agree with Juan, right? You feel like the curfew is really important, but, but I'm wondering, can you see it from his viewpoint? that none of his friends are having a curfew. Yeah, well, but I'm not gonna let him have a curfew. Yeah, no, 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 I got it. Like, that's your position. But, but can you understand that Juan sees that differently? You don't have to agree with him, but can you understand how Juan sees that as restrictive? Yeah, I'm sure he sees it as restrictive. Okay, good. So you accept that he sees this as really restrictive. Yeah, okay, cool. So Juan, on the other hand, like you don't think that you should have a curfew, but, but can you see how mom might be concerned about that and how mom might be using the curfew to try and keep you safe? Yeah, well, I'm not saying that I can't have any curfew. I'm just saying like nine o'clock is ridiculous. Ah, so you accept the fact that mom wants you to have a curfew. You just don't agree with the curfew of nine o'clock. Yeah, exactly. And so what you're doing is you're facilitating acceptance in the family system. And many times just getting people to, to get out from behind their bunker where they're trying so hard to convince the other person of their position and just getting them to acknowledge, yeah, I understand the other position. I just don't agree with it. Uh, many times that will actually start the process of communication moving forward again. All right. And then problem solving in a family system. Um, you get lots and lots of training in the alcohol and other drug studies program at San Diego City College on techniques like motivational interviewing and solution focused counseling and other techniques working towards problem solving. So in introducing this concept, I'm not going to give you an exhaustive description of what collective problem solving looks like, but I do want you to note that it's the family's task to solve the problems in the family systems, not the counselor's task. So we typically don't lead with giving advice. Untrained clinicians will give advice all the time or, or wanna be clinicians. A lot of people feel like, yeah, I should be a counselor because I'm great at giving people advice. Uh, giving people advice often doesn't work. People are often uh, resistant to getting advice from somebody else. They feel like the other person doesn't understand their position. And ultimately telling someone what to do isn't teaching them how to solve their problems themselves. And so uh, I could be a counselor working with a family and say, okay, so you know what you all need to do? Uh, the curfew should be 9.30. So Juan, you should just accept that. And mom, at least you get that. And you guys should have a family night on Friday. So Juan, instead of you going out, you should all play board games. And I'm giving them lots and lots of advice. Well, inevitably what's gonna happen is they're not gonna be satisfied with my advice. They're not gonna feel heard. That's not the solution they wanted to come up with. And so they're gonna to tend to resist that. And even if they were to take my advice, that may solve the problem temporarily, but it's not actually teaching the family how to solve their own problems. Uh, it's like the biblical parable, right? Give a person a fish, feed them for a day, teach a person to fish, feed them for a lifetime. And so our goal as counselors is to help teach families how to solve their own problems. And so there's lots of ways to do that. Uh, we go over this again in many other lectures and throughout the AODS program. 
Uh, but identifying past solutions that worked is always a key dimension to collective problem solving. Uh, finding out resources that might be helpful, helping the family brainstorm uh, alternate behaviors and actions, and developing coping skills to deal with what the situations are. Uh, there's a lecture that I'll be giving on treatment planning uh, that has some more detail about the types of techniques we use to help people solve their own problems. And then other family counseling skills that we utilize include listening and empathizing and joining with the family. Many times we are the ones that may have to initiate discussions, especially if talking about the discussion is hard. Uh, seeking opinions and information from all the family members. In most families, there's a couple people that dominate, and a lot of people have developed homeostasis by being quiet or withdrawn. And so part of our job is getting everybody to jump in and speak about these things. Uh, helping people identify feelings. There's lots of evidence that people typically don't talk about feelings. Uh, in families where there's high stress like substance use disorders, uh, many times actually expressing feelings is um, actively discouraged. And so part of our job is helping family members identify their feelings, uh, finding solutions, using gatekeeping, clarifying. Uh, I've mentioned a number of these things previously. Uh, harmonizing or attempting to help people reconcile disagreements using consensus testing. Uh, I'm wondering, are you all in agreement about this solution or are there some other thoughts uh, and helping negotiate compromises. Uh, the last thing to cover as in, this in, in this introduction to family counseling is the importance of creating a safe and therapeutic space. So in order to conduct family counseling, there's a couple of base agreements that have to be in place. So first of all, the safety of all the participants has to be guaranteed. Family members arguing with each other in a family counseling session is typical. So it's totally okay to have an argument, but violence cannot be tolerated. If people feel unsafe, then they're not gonna talk, they're not gonna listen, they're certainly not gonna accept, uh, and it's not gonna work. So if threats happen in a family counseling session, I'm always quick to jump on that and say, whoa, 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 we can disagree with each other, but as soon as we start threatening each other, uh, people are gonna start to shut down and that's not okay. And so arguments are okay, violence can't be tolerated. Uh, there's an entire lesson that's given in uh, the family counseling class in the Alcohol and Other Drug Studies program about domestic violence assessment. Uh, domestic violence screening and assessment is a primary practice for substance use counselors, and there's an entire lecture uh, that I will provide on domestic violence uh, screening and assessment. But uh, the bottom line for the purposes of this lecture is that if there is domestic violence, then many times family counseling is contraindicated or not recommended. Uh, you can't do uh, family counseling if there's legal constraints. So if somebody has a restraining order, then they're not allowed to participate in the substance use counseling session. And every member has to have a voice, uh, meaning that everyone's opinion is solicited, everybody needs to speak up, and every member can raise an issue, even if somebody else in the family system doesn't want to talk about it. Uh, that's how you maintain a safe and therapeutic environment. So guarantee safety, no violence, no legal constraints, and everybody has to be able to have a voice. All right, so that takes us to the end of this introductory lecture on family counseling. Uh, in the family counseling class in the Alcohol and Other Drug Studies program, we go into numerous uh, other lectures related to family counseling, and we'll get a little more specialized with all of that. Uh, but for now, we will end here, and I hope you enjoyed this introductory lecture to family counseling in substance use treatment.